What's good, YouTube? It's Luis Gusto. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we're in the capital of Latin America, AKA Magic City. It was once an exotic tropical destination for East Coast elites, but today it's an exotic tropical destination for the entire world. That's right, we're in Miami, Florida. And in this film, we're gonna be answering some questions like, how did Miami go from swampy town with a couple of trading posts on the river to major global city? What are some of the neighborhoods that make up Miami? And what are the best things to do and best foods to eat in Miami? But before we get started, come on, you already know what to do. Go ahead and finesse that like button, subscribe, if you are new to the channel and be sure to join my Patreon community for exclusive bonus content. I also have a trivia question for you guys. The name Miami comes neither from English nor Spanish. Where does it come from and what does it mean? And with that all out the way, let's go ahead and explore Miami. Miami is located in the southeastern United States in the southeastern tip of the Florida Peninsula, about 1,200 miles from Chicago. The metropolis grew out from two major bodies of water, the Miami River and Biscayne Bay. Nearby major cities include Orlando, Atlanta, and La Habana. To get to Miami, we flew into Miami International Airport, aka MIA. You can also fly into Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood International Airport and head south about 25 miles. Amtrak also takes you to Miami. There's a station located right near downtown. And finally, if you love driving, you can take I-95 South to get to Miami. The city of Miami is laid out on a grid system with four quadrants, northeast, southeast, southwest, and northwest. In general, streets run east-west and avenues run north-south. The zero point of the Miami grid is right behind me at Flagler Street and Miami Avenue. To get around Miami, utilize their very robust public transportation system, which includes a trolley, a metro bus, a metro rail, which is an elevated train, and the metro mover, which is a monorail. At least 10,000 years ago, Native Americans were living in South Florida. Centuries before D. Wade and Shaq brought the first NBA title here, the Tequesta called the area now known as Miami home. Their society was based around taking advantage of natural resources and utilizing the local environment to the best of their abilities. And they were especially skilled at fishing. The epicenter of their villages, which stretched all the way to the Florida Keys, was where the Miami River meets Biscayne Bay. In the 16th century, Spaniards arrived in South Florida for the first time. The Tequesta, having been warned by their friends in the Caribbean, about the Europeans were prepared and entered into a conflict that would last more than 100 years. Unfortunately, their population would be decimated by both warfare and disease. Beginning in 1565, Spain controlled Florida, and for more than 200 years, they launched multiple colonization efforts on the peninsula, none of which were particularly successful. And in 1821, Florida was sold to the United States. In the intermittent years, the Seminole Nation moved into the area, which led to the development of Fort Dallas and multiple wars between the United States and the Seminole Nation. Fort Dallas was eventually purchased by Miami co-founder Julia Tuttle. The name Miami comes neither from the Tequesta nor the Seminole, but rather another tribe that lived close to Lake Okeechobee, once known as Lake Miami. And the city takes its name from the Miami River, Miami literally translating to big water. Henry Flagler was a founder of Standard Oil, and in the late 19th century, he traveled to Jacksonville, Florida with his first wife. After becoming enamored with the state, he decided to leave his day-to-day -day operations at the company to instead focus on creating a new American Riviera in Florida. He architected the Florida East Coast Railway, which was to stretch all the way to West Palm Beach. However, that area had just experienced a deep freeze, which Miami escaped. Around the same time, he met with Tuttle, who along with neighbors William and Mary Brickle, agreed to give over large portions of their land to Flagler in exchange exchange for extending his East Coast Railway down to Miami. It bears mentioning that to build his railway, Flagler utilized convict leasing, which was a form of slavery in everything but name in the American South of the 19th century. The city of Miami was founded in 1896, and black people who helped build the city were excluded from land ownership except for a small area which eventually became Overtown, a thriving community in its own right for several decades. In the 1920s, South Florida experienced a major land boom. This eventually slowed and then came to a devastating halt due to the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. In the years that followed, Miami's economy was greatly aided by tourism. After World War II, the city's population grew exponentially once again, and in the 1960s, the city of Miami would forever be changed as thousands of Cubans fleeing Fidel Castro's regime arrived in this city. Refugees from Haiti also arrived and began settling in Lemon City, which eventually became known as Little Haiti. More immigrant groups from Latin America and the Caribbean made the journey, which fundamentally created a brand new Miami, one that is much closer to what we know it as today, a multicultural global city with entertainment and a strong economy. The 
Magic City is divided into over 20 neighborhoods, including downtown. This is where you're gonna find the origin point of Miami's grid system and some of the most historic buildings from the 1920s and 30s. You'll also find some of the city's most historic skyscrapers like the Miami Tower. Wynwood was once nicknamed Little San Juan for its large Boricua population. And up until a couple of decades ago, it was an abandoned garment district. But thanks to the vision of a man named Tony Goldman, it transformed into one of the hottest neighborhoods of Miami, known the world over for its glorious street art. Little Havana is one of Miami's most popular neighborhoods. It's located just west of downtown. And believe it or not, it was once a Jewish neighborhood. But beginning in the 1960s, it was the main destination for Cuban immigrants coming to South Florida. Around Little Havana, you're gonna find shopping, vibrant music, great food, lots of liveliness. You'll hear Spanish being spoken all over this neighborhood. The Design District is a small, trendy neighborhood with lots of high-end shopping and art galleries. It's at the crossroads of Little Haiti, Buena Vista, and Wynwood. It's my first time in Miami's design district. Kind of fell into some disrepair in the late 90s, early 2000s, before going through a restoration. Very similar to other artsy and trendy neighborhoods all across the United States. Behind me is a sculpture by Buck Mr. Fuller, and we're gonna explore some of his dope architecture, trendy shops, maybe by Narissa, a Dior. But there's one more prominent area of Miami that you may be wondering about, because we haven't talked about it yet. It's actually not part of Miami at all, but rather its own city, and that is Miami Beach. Vamos a la playa. The city of Miami Beach was founded in 1915. It was once a loose collection of swamps, mangroves, and shoddy beaches. And in its early years, many people attempted to convert it into farmland. John S. Collins was one such entrepreneur who attempted to grow produce on the island. He coined the term Miami Beach, and along with his family, began residential and commercial development in the area. After lots of grueling work done by hardworking but poorly treated laborers, Miami Beach was converted into a human-made island suitable for recreation and habitation. In the early 20th century, it became a world-class tourist destination punctuated by the construction of hundreds of Art Deco buildings. A few decades later, Miami Beach experienced a sharp decline along with the destruction of many of their Art Deco treasures. Thankfully, the Miami Design Preservation League stepped up to help create the Art Deco Historic District, and today Miami Beach has the largest concentration of Art Deco buildings anywhere in the world. Miami Beach is also facing a huge problem moving into the future, global warming. Will this island even exist in 20, 30, 40 years? We don't know. But for now, Miami Beach remains a world-class tourist destination with beautiful beaches, including the world-famous South Beach, great restaurants, beautiful hotels, lovely architecture, and a lot of fun things to do. When you think about Miami, let's be honest, architecture is not really the first thing that comes to mind. However, Miami has the third largest skyline in the entire United States. Before being bought out by Macy's, Burdines was Miami's department store, founded in 1898. Though it's seen better days, this art modern building was its flagship location beginning in 1938. The Meyer Kaiser Building, AKA the Dade Commonwealth Building, was constructed in 1925. Originally 17 stories, it was damaged by the Great Miami Hurricane of 1926. It was rebuilt smaller and served as a bank before becoming vacant. The design of the Miami-Dade County Courthouse was originally entered into a competition for Atlanta City Hall. At the time of its completion in 1928, this neoclassical structure was Miami's tallest building. It still serves as the county's main civil courthouse. Oldest Catholic church in Miami is Jesu Church, established in 1896. This building was completed in 1925 and is a combination of Spanish and Italian Renaissance styles. When construction of one Biscayne Tower wrapped up in 1973, it was Miami Miami's tallest building. Designed by exiled Cuban architects Alonso Fraga y Gutierrez, it remains a symbol of the city. The Miami Tower is one of the city's greatest examples of modern architecture. Built in 1987 and once home to the notorious Centrust Bank, you'll frequently see this landmark 47-story building featured in movies and television shows. In the 1950s, the Miami modernist style emerged, and one of its finest examples is the former Bacardi headquarters, completed in 1963. The tower building was designed by Enrique Gutierrez and the entire complex is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Miami's most iconic building is the Freedom Tower, modeled after the Giralda Tower in Spain. It served as the Ellis Island for Cubans arriving to South Florida in the 1960s, and today it's an art museum. It was built in 1925 for the Miami News, a popular evening newspaper that folded in 1988. Over in Miami Beach, there are numerous beautiful examples of Art Deco architecture.
visit Miami, you want to know what are the best foods you need to try and the best restaurants you have to eat at. Good morning from Miami. We are at Eternity Coffee Roasters. I got me a pour over. Looking at street art and walking around Wynwood Walls works up quite the appetite and it's lunchtime. So Narissa and I came to 1-800-LUCKY. It is an Asian food court. We are back in downtown Miami for the first dinner of our trip at Motec. It's an Israeli Mediterranean restaurant in this small indoor mall. We're at Versailles, which is the world's most famous Cuban restaurant. It's lunchtime in Little Havana and we are at Sandwich in Miami. This is a spot that makes Cuban sandwiches, as you might imagine from the name. It is happy hour, so we're at Crazy about you in the Brickell neighborhood of Miami. If you're looking for something that's outside of the touristy parts of Miami and a nice dinner, this would be the place to come, NIU Kitchen in downtown Miami. Cafe Bastille is a French cafe in downtown Miami on Southeast First Street. It was started by a French couple from Paris and they specialize in breakfast, brunch, and lunch. We visited 18 of Miami's best restaurants on our food tour. Check out the first link in description. a global destination with millions of visitors per year and millions more residents in the metro area, Miami tiene un montón de cosas que hacer. Wynwood Walls is an outdoor museum conceived in 2009 by Tony Goldman, who was the businessman that had the vision to revitalize this entire neighborhood. All around you in Wynwood Walls are abandoned warehouses. This was once a garment district, and now it's an open-air museum. Street artists from all around the world have come to Wynwood to paint these walls. We took a bus from downtown down to Wynwood. It's just so beautiful. The last time we were here, it was actually free. Now they charge admission, but I'm so glad that they do because last time it was so crowded, you could barely get the photos you wanted. You kind of had to sneak around a bunch of people. Is it worth it? I would say definitely. Villa Vizcaya, also known as Vizcaya Museum and Gardens, is a historic mansion located right here on Biscayne Bay in the Coconut Grove neighborhood of Miami. It was built in the early 1900s for wealthy Chicagoan James Deering. The mansion is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The architecture is a mixture of Italian Renaissance. There are also beautiful Italian and French Renaissance gardens located right next to the mansion. We're standing in the beautiful French and Italian Renaissance gardens here in the Vizcaya Museum. It's such gorgeous weather. The trees, the flowers, the leaves, everything is just so beautiful. We're right here on Biscayne Bay and it's so peaceful. Anywhere you walk here, you can hear the sound of water. I really love the beautiful coral and limestone structures and perfect mix of Miami and Renaissance. This entire complex was once mangroves and James Deering himself was a preservationist. So this is why he specifically picked this location right on Biscayne Bay. It's beautiful. You get a magnificent view of the water, nice breeze coming off there, all sorts of tree and plant life. I can't say enough about this museum. It is absolutely beautiful, worth the price of admission. Every single room is fascinating in its own way. It is a must see when you come to Miami. Collins Park is a small yet magnificent park located right in the heart of Miami Beach, about a block right from the public beach. In this tiny park, you have some magnificent trees, public art sculptures, busts of famous scientists from Cuba and all over Latin America, and a contemporary art museum. How's that for a small park? Like most public parks in Miami, it is completely free. You can get yourself some shade underneath one of these gigantic trees. ICA Miami is a contemporary art museum in the Design District neighborhood of the city. There are three floors of art for you to explore, plus a sculpture garden. ICA is open every day except Monday and Tuesday. Admission is completely free. A lot of different exhibits, painting sculptures that make you think and change your perspective. A little short film that I really found fascinating. Overall, I had a great time. Bayside Marketplace is Miami's number one tourist attraction. It opened up in 1987 and it's located right on Biscayne Bay. It's an entertainment complex. You've got dining, live music, and it's right on the water giving you picturesque views of Biscayne Bay. Personally, I've been coming to Bayside since I was about yay high, 
growing up in South Florida. So some of my best memories of Miami are right here at Bayside with the family. Bayside was frequently featured on the hit 1980s cop show Miami Vice and has nothing to do with Bayside High of Saved by the Bell. Bayfront Park is a great urban green space right on the water. The beach walk in Miami Beach is a multiple miles long pathway for walkers, runners, and bikers. Renting a city bike is a fun way to experience Miami. With so many options for hotels in Miami, how do you even choose? Well, that's where we come in. So we booked our stay at the East Miami Hotel, which is in the Brickell neighborhood of Miami. It's actually part of a larger complex called the Brickell City Center, which includes shopping, fine dining, and even condos. It's a four-star hotel. One of the best things about East Miami is that every room has a balcony. We have a beautiful view of the Miami River facing north. We got the City View King Room, a really huge shower with two types of faucets, the traditional wand shower and also a rain faucet that comes right down on you. The washroom is kind of like an open concept, which is a little interesting. There's no actual like traditional door to close the washroom. It kind of opens out to the rest of the room. We did get a late checkout, so that was nice and otherwise the staff has been pretty friendly. The best thing about this hotel is the location. So close to the Metro Mover stop, lots of public transportation, and all kinds of electric scooters around here. One of the big things that I was looking forward to staying at East Miami was going to the Sugar Rooftop Bar. Made reservations, but there was no mention of a minimum consumption. Then when we got to the door, they told us that per person, you had to spend a minimum of $100. I would have liked to know that in advance, especially being a guest of the hotel, and this was not communicated clearly, so we weren't able to try that and review that for you guys I'm sorry to say the Plymouth Hotel is a small independent luxury hotel in Miami Beach right across the street from Collins Park the hotel is in a beautifully restored Art Deco building and y'all know how much I love the Art Deco the room was nice we had a queen-size bed with a view of the pool they include a complimentary breakfast with your reservation at a cool little diner down the street and everything about this hotel gives me good vibe got a whole old-school flow to it the lobby is retro they have a little phone booth check out and check in takes just a little bit longer but I think it's well worth the wait I would definitely stay at the Plymouth Hotel again they have a private beach and are conveniently located to everything that you want to do here in Miami Beach Chris and I spent a week down here in the Sunshine State's biggest city. We definitely had so much fun exploring Miami's neighborhoods. I really love the layout of downtown and I think it has some really dope historic buildings. Some that are probably overlooked that you're not really gonna see upon first glance when you're looking to book your Miami trip. But I definitely think it's worth going a little bit out of your way to explore the downtown area. It really does have so much potential, but I really love what I'm seeing with the personal electric vehicles. Hopefully we're in a transition period when it comes to Miami and other large global cities where we can start getting cars out and getting people in pedestrian zones bike lanes that are protected I think we all want this when we come to a destination like Miami we don't want to be walking on a thin sidewalk with cars rushing by on either side Miami has some great restaurants amazing beaches Miami Beach in itself can be its own travel guide by the way let me know in the comments below if you want to see a full Miami Beach travel guide they have a robust public transit system a great multicultural scene with lots of great food music architecture history so many things to do. It's a little on the pricier side, but hey, that's what you get when you come to Miami. You can plan your trip in so many different ways. If there are any spots that we missed, definitely let us know in the comments below. To get the answer to the trivia question, the name Miami comes from the language of a Native American tribe that lived near Lake Okeechobee back in the day. In the comments below, let us know what city you'd like us to visit next. And if you enjoyed this Miami travel guide, go ahead and finesse that like button, subscribe if you are new to the channel, and I would really appreciate it if you share this film with your very best friend. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time, but for now, I'm out of here. Peace and blessings.